Good afternoon and uh, welcome. We are facing an unprecedented crisis, a health crisis and an economic crisis on a global scale. Economic turn down, downturns are impossible to predict, although they are as sure as sunrise. The running joke is that experts correctly anticipated seven out of the last three microeconomic events. But uh, it is difficult to predict uh, when it's happening. But McKinsey uh, has researched more than 1,000 public traded companies and examined their performance since the last downturn. About 10% of those companies did better than the rest. So what made them different? Did they simply get lucky? According to McKinsey, the best 10% had a nerve system for faster decision-making. So in simple terms, they argue that the best performing companies swiftly created a cross-functional task force in a time of crisis for faster decision-making. So today we are joined by Dan Kiefer. Dan Kiefer has great experience with strategy execution and management systems. Dan has worked as a general manager at Harley Davidson and concurrently he also held a position as vice president of uh, operational excellence. Later, he became the senior vice president of operations and uh, intermatic. Today, Don is senior lecturer at MIT in Boston, and he's also founder of Swiftgear Work Design, a global consultant firm. On our programs, we are privileged to work closely with Don to help many executives become better at strategy execution and setting up their management systems. Many executives report back to us that their benefits are impressive after their course with Don Kiefer. ABT Business School always try to find the best people around the world to help managers, leaders, and organization perform better. Today, we hope that you will be inspired to help your people and your organization. The agenda for today is that the webinar lasts 30 minutes, and in the last five minutes, there will be time for Q&A. You can ask questions in the chat function and I'll ask Don those questions uh, in the Q&A. We are also recording this uh, webinar, so you will see the video after uh, this event. Hopefully, you are all comfortable seated and uh, you might have a cup of coffee or tea next to you. Uh, we are, as we are streaming live from Boston, uh, we are happy that Netflix reduced their use of internet last week, and we hope that the connection works well for you all. In the coming weeks, we'll be sharing more resources. Currently, we are creating a toolkit that we are calling Resource Collection in a Crisis to help you handle this crisis. So if you're interested, please follow us on social media or sign up for our newsletter and we'll send information about these resources. So, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure to welcome Dun Kiefer to this webinar with the title, Finding Direction in a Crisis. How to get everyone on the same page. So Don, over to you. Thank you, Jesper. Uh, you failed to emphasize my favorite job, which is uh, 
teaching at ABT, which I've been doing, I guess, almost 10 years now. So I'm guessing there are many people listening today who've been in class with me or that we've had the pleasure to work. hello to everyone, and I hope you're doing well. I'd like to offer just a suggestions for working in these times of crisis when everything begins moving faster, time shrink, and new and large issues quickly. There are two things that people naturally do in times of crisis, and we're going to build on those two. The first one is they begin talking to each other. They go to phone instead of email. They go to video instead of phone, or they go to face-to-face -face meetings, which is the best most rich form of human communication there is. Email is a terrible substitute for getting together and talking. And we do another thing. We use visual tools. Get together in a room and begin putting things away so we can all begin to see the same situation, the same event, the same problem. We get together in a war room or a situation room and begin to post on the what are the biggest targets. What are the metrics? What's happened? Who's what? And we begin to very quickly organize ourselves because again, that form of face-to-face -face conversation, that form of face-to-face -face conversation is the, is the best form for humans. So why is, well, why do we use the tool? First of all, when I can represent the work and the situation on the wall, and we can all stand around and look at it and decide what to do, if force everyone to be so clear about what they see on the same page, the same day, and what they're going to do. And if I, in front of my colleagues, put it up on the board that says, I'm gonna do X, Y, Z, I'm now accountable. So it forces clarity and accountability. Everyone can see the entire data and the entire set of activities Naturally, my experience is going to begin thinking of questions that I wouldn't have seen just in an email. So now we can trigger participants' deep experience and judgment. Uh, let's see. There we go. And when that happens, inquiry and collaboration. Instead of looking at my piece and defending my piece in like a normal staff meeting, now I'm asking you about yours. How does yours fit to mine? And we begin to collaborate naturally because again, we're all looking at the same data in the same situation. We can see problems in real time, so we can solve them faster and better. We can share the learnings in real time. And most importantly, speeds decision making and speeds deciding what we're going to do. So we can quickly meet in front of a visual wall representing the situation, decide what's happening, decide who's gonna do what, and get into action quickly, coordinated action. Why does this work? Let me just give you a, one bit of the science, many of you will recall this, um, is that we actually have two different ways our brain processes um, information. One, one you're most familiar with called conscious processing. This is where we uh, sit down and solve a problem using our brain. This part of our brain is very powerful, but the weakness is it can only do one thing at a time and we can only use it when we're awake. The other part of our brain, the older part of our brain, is way more powerful. And this is the part of the brain where most of our experience lies. And this part of the brain gets smarter through repetition. The way it gives us ideas is through pattern matching, not logic. So it quickly looks at that all the wealth of experience and pattern you have and comes up with a solution. The benefit of this is um, one, you can't control it. It's working all the time, even when you sleep, and it's very, very, very fast, faster than the other part of your brain. So this can, uh, the problem with this part of the brain is, there's a couple problems with it. One is that sometimes it comes up with the wrong answer. It's called jumping to conclusions or jumping to solution first instead of examining the problem statement. And the other part of this problem with this brain is it's not capable of language. So sometimes when you know something, you find it really hard to explain, find it hard to articulate, that's why. You know how to do it, but it's harder to show people or to tell people why. So the very act of writing the problem, the situation down on stupid little post-it note board, 
forces that brain to connect with our rational brain in ways that we can care and get smarter and articulate the issues we have and begin to see things that we that we think we know, but until we put it on the board, we can't really be sure. So let me give a simple structure in these times of crisis for organizing and getting more structure to your crisis meetings, your war room meetings, or ever, any type of meetings you're having. The most important thing is it's super clear on what the targets are. Right now we're getting a lot of, I'm getting a lot of calls from former students in the US who work in healthcare. And the first thing we're telling them is get super clear on your targets. For example, uh, you have to stay safe because if the healthcare workers are not safe, they can't help people. The second thing is pay, you know, help, the, help the patients. And third thing, maintain a, a, a supply of materials. You have to be super clear on what the priorities are. So in business that might um, make sure we're all connected somehow virtually. Then let's make sure that the clients are okay. And third, let's make sure the cash flow is going well. Whatever those priorities are, make them clear. Write them down so everyone can agree what they are. Then the next thing is on the slide, starting from the left, we're going to take all the ideas that we have about meeting those targets and put them on a thing called the priority matrix. And it's just a little too simple two by two matrix. On one side, we're going to do impact, more impact, less impact. And on the other, we're going to do effort, high effort, low effort. And we're going to put all these ideas and sort them together by standing in front of the board and moving them until we agree on the relative priority of all the ideas that we have. Most of the times when I do this, they break up into three kind of natural groupings. Up in the upper right hand corner, there are ones that are take little effort, but are powerful. They're very fast and have a lot of effect. And we're going to go to this. In the middle section, there are some things take a little more effort, a little less impact, and we're going to talk about those and decide. And usually we have more ideas to do. And so the ones in the bottom left, we have to wait if we actually have to. In the next middle section, you see a column called next. This is kind of a gate. Kind of like the airplane, if you remember an analogy from teaching, which is when's the last time you change how many people fly, who's flying on the airplane? And the answer is when they close the door. So this is the airplane door, and this is where we control how many activities we take from thinking about them to doing them. The problem is if we start working on them all, you're going to flood the system and you're going to be highly ineffective. What we want to do is just have the priority give one problem or two problems to one person, let them get it done with no delay, and then go get the next one. This is called the pull system. Use it, they use it in manufacturing all the time. But the idea is I can only work on one thing at a time. So if you give me four, I'm just switching back and forth and back and forth. But if we decide what the top priority is for me to do, and I can go do it, focus on it without switching around, without interruption, and get it done, you're actually gonna increase the amount of work you can do at least by 30, 40%, at least. So that, that center section of the next is kind of a gate and we're only gonna let the other pieces in when someone is, uh, has the capacity to do work. So the issue board is where we're actually solving problems. And you can see, just if anyone knows um, the structured format of A3 or DMAIC, we can split problem solving up into different states. And I've done it here, four simple ones. First, the problem is clear and it's assigned. So we have Helen's column, a row, we have Merritt's row, we have Casper's row, and Rudy's row. The next piece they're gonna do is they're gonna go investigate it, then they're gonna design the solution, and then they're gonna implement it. And the reason we break this up is that every time you have a meeting, the person can move the problem step by step. We can talk about it to see if they've missed their, anything or if, anyone under, if everyone understands what's happening and agrees so we, we don't get confused. This is really important. It has a lot of kind of really clever little tricks in it. One, the visualization to get super clear. Two, get all the ideas on the wall. Three, assign them, but not too many, one at a time to keep good productivity. So let me show you a picture. And it's simple, on a board with post-it notes. It does not have to be complicated. I know a lot of you are having to work virtually, 
So there are ways to do this virtually. Um, there's a lot of little programs out there. I would suggest um, the boss keep a physical board. People can report in and then just take a picture, iPhone picture of the board and change and keep the status around. And then everyone can and then update the boss's board. Some simple trick. But basically, what you want, it's not about the post-it notes. It's about we're all looking at the same information, discussing what's the most important thing to do, who's going to do it, and we're going to go get it done and report back what happened and if it had the effect we wanted. That's what you want. It's that human connection. Now, if you do this well, and if you make progress on keeping your organization very connected, problem solving, diagnosing very quickly and getting things done, closing the gap to the most important things. One, you're going to enjoy it because you're, you're going to get a lot done. But if you get good at this, my counsel to you is keep using these practices as the organization begins to wind down and life begins to get back to normal. If you can carry those skills that people naturally use in crisis management into your base organization, you're gonna get stronger forever. We always want people connected with what the targets are, with what the priorities are, with who's doing what. Never overload them. All have high throughput and quality engagement of the work going through. If you can translate those skills into a little slower cadence in normal life, your organization is gonna keep stronger forever. I'll show you some pictures of uh, my work life when I had a real job before teaching of what that looks like. But, but before that, I wanna talk just about quickly about the four principles of dynamic work design. The way to do this is to sit down and think about the situation or to examine the situation and ask these questions one by one to see where you can strengthen the work that you're doing. The first is reconcile intent activity. Again, what we're all trying to do is get super in the targets, and how we measure them clear on the human activity that ought to get done. And what we want to happen is we want to look at, say, these activities, we believe this is the best set of activity that will close the gap. And then we want to do it and check, see if it had the intended effect. That's the reconciliation. Get intent, activity, and reconcile. This work, and then we create it, get the feedback, and we get learning loop. The faster your work is going, the more frequently you need to do this. So right now, you might be doing it every hour, twice a day, once a day. In normal life, it could take the form of a daily huddle, weekly staff meeting. It's slowed down a little bit, but the idea is the same. The second thing is we want to connect the human chain through inputs and outputs. As the work is moving through your situation, through your organization, I get input, I do work, my output goes to a person. Are those two people connected? Is my output their input? And when there's something wrong, do we know who each other are so we can communicate quickly? So the inputs and outputs, we want to connect the path the work is moving through from person to person to person. Not by department, not by process, by person to person, regardless if they're supplier, they're in a different department, in a different organization, it doesn't matter. If the path of the work, the work doesn't care who they work for, and make sure that's well organized. The second way we want to organize work, up and down the organization through triggers and checks. And what this means is, if I have a problem, do I know who to call? Do they know I'm going to call them and respond right away? So there are two mechanisms we use to this. The first check. This is a normal meeting. So, um, Today, we're all going to get in front of the board and do a check and make sure everyone's okay. What the issues are, we adjust the activity set and go. It's a check. It's time based and it's on a regular cadence. Whether it's every hour, twice a day, once a day, once a week, or once a year, it's the same design element of we're going to come and check the whole situation. The second element is a trigger. This is kind of like the uh, and on cord on the Toyota assembly line, which is this is event based, not time based. This is, I call, I pull a trigger when I see a problem and I need help. The best uh, metaphor for this or analogy for this is a fire alarm. So when you pull the fire alarm, first of all, everyone knows the conditions under which we should pull a fire alarm. And, and we also know who's going to respond and they're going to respond quickly. 
So put those triggers in place. It's easy. For example, you say, Don, how long do you think it's going to take you to do this? I said, I think I'll be done by tomorrow at noon. You, then you would say, okay, if it gets to be one o'clock, I want you to call me for help, even if you think it take you another hour, because we know that people will tend to keep going, keep going, and ask. Put those triggers in place, the criteria, when people need to check in based on the situation. So you can get, um, get issues escalated and help the people that need it to keep moving quickly. The third piece is, third principle is structure problem solving and creativity. This is just what you saw on the issue board. And the trick here is to write the problem statement down, to write the data down, because now we engage that rational brain rather than just trying to do things, jumping to a solution, jumping to a uh, uh, bad solution. So we're gonna slow this down. That's uh, the structure of um, A3, Demaic, all those tools does the same thing. By writing things down, it forces you into your rational brain. Now you can do structured problems. And the fourth principle has to do with how much work is in the system. On the board, I said, don't put too much in there. So are people doing too much work? Is too much work clogging the system? It might feel good to say everyone's working on 50 things, but it's gonna take a lot longer to get the 50 done than if you pick off five at a time, guaranteed. I didn't make this up, it's just a rule. If you're driving quickly in rush hour traffic one day, you put too many cars on the highway, it just doesn't move as fast. So be careful that you have not too much work in the system so that it's moving. So if you use those, those four principles in the question to think about where you are in your organization, you will get stronger. And this is sort of what it looks like ongoing. This is a, a from Intermatic. I left Harley's my quality managers board. So you can see targets left and the activities on the right by month. You can see they're crossed out. It's very activity safe. So if my manager is not meeting his targets, I'm going to go look at the board with him. He has the wrong set of uh, issues, activity board, or he hasn't done them. So if you're not meeting your targets, Either you've got the wrong activity set or you're not doing them. Simple as that. Then we can just take it one step higher. So on, this is my office, actually. This is about 5,000 people around the globe when I was, again, had a job. On the left, you see the metrics and the targets. The middle section is the activity set. And on the far right is the issue board, just like I've shown you. So one last piece, how do you get started? You really need to think about four things. One get the targets really super clear and prioritized. Two, put numbers on them, KPIs. This is a bridge, I'll show you why, because you're gonna do activities. What's the activity set to close those targets? So, um, and then what are the issues we have? And we have a bridge because the target and the activity, one is the plan, one is the actual, and when there's a gap, you're gonna have a learning event. You're gonna get smarter. That's it. I hope that's helpful. Uh, there, are, there is a page here of some articles and further reading that you can get from MIT for free. For, and also uh, all Thursday US time, the Sloan Management Review uh, site is open. Uh, you can download anything you want. But these happen to be the four articles that around this topic of dynamic work design that you may find helpful. Okay, Jesper, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Don. Uh, so again, just for housekeeping rules, you can uh, ask questions in the chat function and, um, uh, and on, uh, Don will try to answer those um, um, that you write down. Um, Don, in, in the, just uh, you referred to it um, for a couple of times, but uh, in terms of how, to, because again, you showed as, um, you know, from, from working face to face or et cetera, even though you actually had uh, 5,000 people around the world working on uh, this. Um, but in terms of now, we are basically all uh, mainly sitting uh, at home working on these projects. Um, and, and you mentioned some systems, but is there anything else that you like to add in terms of how, how do we get, you know, uh, people on the same, um, working towards the same issues 
uh, if we've never worked with an issue board like this before? Do you think that's feasible? Um, I think it's feasible, especially you can make it more simple. You don't have to break it into four steps. You can just say who's working on it and when they think they're going to be finished and then check with them every day or however frequently you're checking. But I would build, I would actually make post-it notes or make some physical representation. And if you're working vis, uh, virtually and separated, it's the most important for the leader to have that set of activity in front of them. So they're constantly looking at it and making sure all the pieces fit. And if it's not, then the leader can engage people uh, to solve the problem. But at least the leader's got to have that in front of them to make sure that set of activity and a set of targets all fit. And again, it's easy to share. Use an iPhone, take a picture, share it so people can look at it beforehand, then, then show it while you're talking virtually. All right. Thank you, Roxanne. Uh, in terms of, um, uh, we, we have a question about um, when there's many units involved. Uh, so if, if there's a lot of in, in the interdependency between the different units and, and, and how, do, how do you actually get those to work efficiently to, together? You, you talked about the fire alarm, uh, but, but are there any other comments that you, you like to address in terms of how do, how do you basically get people efficient working together across the different function or units uh, in an organization? So, um, best way to use management chain very effectively. So, uh, for example, this board with Rudy, Casper, Merritt, and Helly could be four leaders, one's running finance, one's running manufacturing, one's running marketing and sales, one's running, I don't know. Legal. So they have a high level view of what's happening, but then they are gonna, if once the leadership is integrated, now they go down and it's not just about their department. They can communicate why Heli or Merrick can communicate why this task is important to the entire organization. And then they can do a local board to break that problem down and on down the chain. So the most important thing is to get the management at a high level in one mind about what the most important thing. So as you pack it down step by step to remote places, people know why they're the tasks that they're doing, how it fits into the bigger picture and why, and then they're motive, more motivated to help and they're connected. So we'll use the management chain for that, which they're supposed to be doing anyway, but it's not always the case. There's always a lot of you know, silos and I wanna do this, that, but most important for a leader to get the management on the same page. We call this, where's your homeroom? The top leaders, the homeroom should be in the staff meeting. Their homeroom is not in their meeting. So like my homeroom, if I'm head of legal, is not legal. My homeroom is the corporate meeting. And I go to legal to get legal to do what we need as a group, not come to the group representing legal to fight for my peace. So where is your homeroom? Is it your function or is it your colleagues? Should be the higher level to make sure the organization is tied together well. Great, uh, thank you much, Dan. In, in terms of um, how, how you manage the, the timeline, uh, because of course it's, it's not on the board here, but, but would you have a specific dates that are also on the issue board or how, how do you um, make sure that people actually adhere to the different timelines uh, um, throughout fixing the, the, the problem? Yeah, it's a good question. And there are a couple ways to think about this. The first thing is the way you work has got to be going as fast or faster than the external world. So right now, the external world is changing very quickly. So people need to be meeting at least every day, sometimes twice a day, some three times a day, depending on how fast their world is changing. This, now, when things slow down, you can go back and spread those meetings out. But right now, things are happening so fast, you could almost probably make decisions at least every day, sometimes twice a day with this, things are moving this fast. If you're having meetings too frequently, there hasn't been enough change to decide anything, then spread it out a little bit. The other thing is that if we say how quickly things need to be done, then instead of saying, Jesper, you have to get this done. I go, Jesper, how fast do you think you can get it done? I wanna ask the person that's going to do the work. Now, Jesper says, Don, I can do that that quickly. Great, then put your number on the 
ticket and work to your own timeline. But if I need it done in one day and Jesper said, it's gonna take me two days, then we're gonna look at the group and say, how can we help get this done in one day? Because we, it has to be done. Don't just yell at Jesper to work faster. Let's think of the structure of the work and see if we can, if we can help and put the activity set together to collapse it in that one day. So I'm gonna work more with the estimates that people give me. And there's another reason this works. It's like a double loop learning. If I ask you how long it's gonna take you, then it's your target. Now you're motivated. Hey, I said I would be done in two days. I, I'm gonna to try to get done in two days. Or if I tell you to get done in two days, you'll go like, no, that's impossible. It's two and a half, it's Don's target. So I think getting people to commit to what they think is actually gonna take creates a learning loop and some commitment in, and accountability in their own mind. Perfect. <clears throat> Thank you, Don. Um, there's a couple of um, uh, more practical questions about uh, online tools uh, that might be available. You, you mentioned a few, uh, but in terms of having, uh, you know, post-it notes on, on some kind of, uh, do, do you know of any particular good tools? Um, in, there, in there are, yes, there are, there are many out there. I, I only know a few of them. Trello is one where you could just put, um, you could put post-its in a column and move them virtually. There's another more complicated one called iobea.com. It's out of Paris. And you could actually build on um, uh, PowerPoint, you could build the background as I have on here, and then you could create um, little post-it notes and move them around. My suggestion is not to get caught up with the software because what you're gonna do is you're gonna get more focused on getting the software working and working the bugs out and then blame the problem on the software than getting the work done. Do that later when things slow down. Don't mess with the software. Try to stay physical, uh, really simple tools and move quickly. All right, thank you very much, Dan. Uh, great pleasure to have you. We've um, just go, gone over a few minutes, um, so we won't have time for any more uh, questions, but it will be, it's recorded, so we'll send it out uh, to you. Um, so thank you much, Don, and hopefully all of the uh, attendees uh, got s some good takeaways from here. So thank you very much for this time, and hopefully we'll see uh, each other again soon. Thank you very much, and hope you all stay safe.